Every autumn, the skies over West Africa witness one of the largest migrations in the animal kingdom. Huge flocks of wading birds leave their summer breeding grounds in Europe, Asia, Siberia, and even North America, and head south to gather here on the coast of Mauritania. To many of us, these are the familiar inhabitants of our rivers and estuaries, but never do we see such congregations. The numbers are staggering, over two million wading birds. They spend the winter alongside the much more exotic species of birds that live here all year round, flamingos and pelicans. For years, exactly where our wading birds spent the winter remained unknown. Everyone assumed it was on African shores, but few people could have imagined that it was here, right on the edge of the hot, dry Sahara Desert. The birds come here to feed along a rich, fertile strip between the desert and the deep blue sea. The transition from desert to ocean is as sharp as a knife edge. The desert, virtually empty and lifeless, is washed by a sea teeming with life. These people, the Imrigan, have been fishing these waters for centuries, sent here by Sahara nomads for a few months each year. Now the Imrigan live and fish here all year round, their catch changing with the seasons. Their fishing techniques have remained unchanged since the Portuguese explored this part of the world for the first time 500 years ago. But while little has altered in these rich, shallow waters over the centuries, the land here has undergone a dramatic change. The Sahel, once a semi-fertile region along the whole southern edge of the Sahara, is now nearly indistinguishable from the desert itself. Twenty years ago, the acacia trees and rough pasture of this area provided good grazing for game and domestic stock, such as camels, goats and sheep. A few of the acacias are still alive and would produce leaves if it were to rain, but it hasn't rained here for 16 years. There are many reasons why this has happened. The lack of rain may be due to the destruction of the Earth's forests. The dry soil simply blows away, leaving only sand. Or it may be that such changes are cyclical and completely natural. The huge and little-known Islamic Republic of Mauritania is bordered by Algeria and Morocco in the north, Mali to the east, and in the south, by Senegal. Abel has spent his entire life here. I remember when this area was covered in trees and there was plenty of grazing. There were ostriches, oryx, addix and gazelle. As the vegetation disappeared, the ostrich were the 
first to go, then the addicts and oryx, and now we only see a few gazelle. All the rest have gone. Despite the hardship, Abel believes his place is in the desert, and it's here and not the town that he will see out his days. The evidence of the Sahel's earlier riches litter the desert. A few bleached bones of a Dorcas gazelle, pieces of pottery and flint arrowheads once used to bring down the plentiful game. In order to protect the remaining wildlife in the desert regions, as well as the birds and marine life along the coast, the government of Mauritania established a national park here in 1976. The Banc d'Argan National Park encompasses some 5,000 square miles of marine and desert habitat. The desert areas are guarded by the camel patrol, who protect the few remaining Dorcas gazelle and other remnants of wildlife from poachers. The guards are part of the nomadic section of the National Army. They're an elite, hand-picked group of men. Camels are by far the most efficient way of patrolling such a large, almost inaccessible area of desert. They also serve to emphasize one of the park's aims of promoting the traditional lifestyles of the Sahara. Small lizards thrive in the heat of the Sahara. It's the larger animals that suffer. Only a few groups of Dorcas gazelle now remain. These are among the smallest gazelle and owe their survival here to their ability to travel huge distances to find grazing and to the fact that they can obtain almost all the water they need from what leaves and tubers they can find. Over half the park's 5,000 square miles is desert. Life here is sparse and has to be highly adapted to survive. The Moila snake avoids the desert heat and is only active during the cooler parts of the day when it hunts for lizards and jerboas. Every so often it cleans out the sand from between its belly scales using its nose. The desert monitor is perfectly adapted to life in deserts from West Africa to the Soviet Union. At almost three feet in length, it's a formidable predator. Despite its name, the sandfish is in fact also a lizard, emerging from the dunes to pounce on insects such as locusts. Some desert creatures obtain their water from animal food. This mantis feeds on small spiders and insects that it can pursue at remarkable speed. Many of the park's plant species, such as this Sodom apple tree, are inedible because of their poisonous sap. The painted lady butterfly can survive in this harsh environment by feeding on the tree's nectar, just as it does in the more familiar setting of our European gardens. Without doubt, the most destructive insect in North Africa is the locust. It's ironic that such a successful animal spells disaster for the desert. Millions upon millions of them appear as if from nowhere and devour anything edible, even the euphorbia with its poisonous sap.
Around this one bush, there are over 100,000 locusts. This plant will probably survive. There's enough of it underground to produce fresh shoots. But because of the scarcity of food, the locust will devastate what little grazing there is. Once they've completely defoliated an area, they'll move on with the next favorable winds, but not until they've laid millions of eggs, a legacy of death lying dormant in the sand. Many of the locusts die and their bodies in turn provide valuable protein and moisture for a variety of scavengers active after sunset. Darkling beetles will eat almost anything they can find. They have powerful jaws that can cut through the locust's tough skin. Scorpions hunt living prey, overpowering their victim with a sting on the tip of their tail. This species, Androctonus, despite its small size, is one of the most dangerous in Africa. Its venom could kill a dog in seconds. The desert viper either hunts down its prey by following tracks with its sensitive tongue, or shuffling down just below the surface of the sand and lying in wait for its victim. From the sand comes a new threat. The next generation of locusts is emerging from its egg pods. Few will survive, but those that do will strip the land of every green leaf. Yet a stone's throw away on the other side of the dunes, the story couldn't be more different. Where the Sahara is washed by the Atlantic Ocean is one of the richest environments on the coast of Africa. The sands are covered in a rich green carpet. Here the park encompasses thousands of acres of seagrass that become exposed at low tide. It's now that hordes of fiddler crabs emerge from their burrows to sift through the mud for food. The male only has one claw free for feeding. The other, much bigger one, is used as a signal to his fellow crabs. But unlike the locusts in the desert, these swarms don't spell death and destruction. They're an indication of the incredible richness of the environment. for such a wealth of life lies in a curious phenomenon known as the upwelling that occurs just off the coast. The hot, dry Saharan winds blow to the west across the Atlantic. As they do so, they push the surface waters out to sea. Cold, nutrient-rich waters well up from the depths to take their place, promoting a rich growth of plant and planktonic life, the basis of the marine food chain. The sea rarely exceeds 15 feet in depth, so the waters are warm and bathed in all-important sunlight. Few animals eat the seagrass or zostera, but a large number come here to feed on the life in, on and under it, and fish migrate here to spawn in it. The rich mud is heaving with mollusks such as clams and cone shells. Some of the most important ones are not much bigger than a matchhead. The tiny hydrobia snails live here in astonishingly high densities, tens of thousands per cubic yard. The leaves of the eelgrass are coated with masses of life, some too small to see, 
Others more apparent, like these encrusting sea squirts that filter out nutrients from the seawater. This abundant food source attracts a whole range of larger animals, like the shovel-nosed ray. It feeds mainly on clams, and its flattened body enables it to move through water only a few inches deep. But it's these mudflats and eel grass beds that attract our wading birds here for the winter. The only way two million birds can live and feed in the same place is by exploiting different parts of this rich environment. Each bird species has its own special prey and a beak to match. The dunlin feeds on worms and mollusks just below the mud surface, while the bar-tailed godwit probes even deeper. The whimbrel preys on the fiddler crabs, breaking off the limbs and then swallowing body and legs separately. The turnstone lives up to its name and picks up the sand hobbers and shrimps beneath. The last stone it turned over could have been on the Severn estuary. The spoonbill probes the shallow waters for small fish and crustaceans, which it detects and catches with its aptly named bill. Although the spoonbills feed in the shallows just off the shore, they roost and breed on some of the tiny remote islands that are dotted throughout the Bonk Dargan National Park. The spoonbills prefer islands with some sort of plant cover and a good supply of dried eel grass to line their nests. They steal each other's nesting material, which invariably leads to a local dispute. The spoonbill's breeding season extends from March to October, and during the winter the numbers of local birds are boosted by migrants that breed in Holland and Spain and overwinter here in the park. The spoonbill chicks are fed on regurgitated food from their parents' beak. Their spoon-shaped bills will develop as they grow. They'll need them. Life for an adult spoonbill seems to be one long dispute with the neighbours. But while most of the spoonbills are here only for the winter, all of the park's 25,000 flamingos are resident. They too exploit a different part of this rich habitat. The curious bill acts as a sieve, filtering out tiny traces of life from the muddy waters. A good paddle helps to stir things up. The flamingos breed on Flamingo Island, whose shape bears a remarkable resemblance to an ear. The dark area near the bottom is the breeding colony. The birds gather to nest here during late April and May, although their numbers seem to fluctuate from year to year.
A single egg is laid on top of a small mound that's built up by the adult as it sits on the nest. It wasn't long ago that the way in which the long-legged flamingo managed to sit down was a matter for speculation. Early morning in the colony is a time for shuffling and flapping. As well as a good stretch, this also serves to reassure the birds that all is well. Some birds have yet to peer up and are already out on the sand parading up and down. The males are larger than the females and the swaying head as they march along is all part of the courtship ritual. Flashing by the males reveals their red markings, a possible indication of their general condition and potential as a mate. It's strange to think that the only trees that are thriving in this part of Mauritania are growing in the sea. Just off the coast of the Sahara, in the centre of the park, is a tiny relict area of mangrove. They're the most northerly occurring mangrove trees on the coast of Africa, and rarely exceed six feet in height. Among their aerial roots in the mudflats lives a tiny amphibious fish, the mud skipper. It's about the size of a man's finger, and it feeds by swallowing large mouthfuls of mud and ejecting the non-edible parts. Above them, in the branches of the mangroves, are over 2,000 nests of the African cormorant, a marine bird, living in a marine environment and nesting in a marine tree. The nests are made of twigs and seagrass, held together by guano. The chicks are almost full-fledged, and they'll be leaving the nest within a week or so. Sharing their branches is a colony of 400 grey reef herons. The cormorants and herons feed almost entirely on fish, and fish is one thing there's no shortage of at the moment in these rich African waters. An eerie sound greets the Saharan dawn. It's milking time for the camels in the nomad camp, and the camels, true to their obstinate nature, are complaining bitterly. Many have young, and only when they have been milked will they be allowed to suckle their calves. But the yield is only a fraction of its potential. The land is overgrazed and now devastated by locusts. Every four or five days, the stock is led to the well, some seven miles away. The wells provide precious water, and the nomads are reluctant to move too far away from them. This places greater pressure on the local environment for grazing and wood. In the past, these people travelled more widely, able to survive between waterholes on rain and the ample milk provided by their herds. Each year, the wells have to be dug deeper. This one is already over 90 feet deep, or, as the nomads would tell you, the height of 18 men. The water is cool but slightly saline, and it's the only source for many miles around. During the middle of the day, temperatures soar to over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. it's impossible to spend more than a few minutes in the open. The nomads while away their time playing a sort of desert drafts.
The counters are whatever is readily available, and that's not much, twigs and camel droppings. During the 1970s, tens of thousands of nomads left their tents and camels and moved to the north to work in the extraction of iron ore. They quit their herds and way of life and moved to the towns. The iron ore is moved to the coast by the world's longest train. Five engines pull a vast column of trucks that stretches for over a mile and a half. But in the late 70s, the price of iron ore dropped dramatically, and thousands of nomads were left jobless, crowded together in huge shanty towns. Their herds gone, it's impossible for them to move back to the desert, which in any case has become increasingly hostile for man and wildlife alike. Even the seeds, lying dormant for years in the earth, ready to burst into life at the onset of the first good downpour, are gradually becoming swamped by waves of drifting dunes as the soil dries and is blown away. Those creatures that aren't reliant on fresh water or plant life are still thriving. The small islands that pepper the waters of the Bank Dargan National Park are ideal nesting sites for the tens of thousands of local seabirds. Their teeming life provides an increasing contrast to the desert beyond. A pair of royal terns perform their courtship dance on the beach. Once the pair bond is established, the birds will remain together for the rest of the season, perhaps even for life, which could be as long as 15 to 20 years. This one has died in a submissive posture. On receiving the signal, the other birds are eager to reinforce their dominance. Royal terns roost in a tightly bunched colony. A thousand eyes are better than two. But this egg is from the abandoned nest of a Caspian tern, a close relative to the royal. Slender-billed gulls are not usually known as egg or chick thieves. They normally feed only on fish and invertebrates. Our own familiar turnstones may spend the winter scavenging the eggs of tropical birds. Outside the breeding colony, pair bonds are still being formed. A potential mate is offered fish by two male suitors. Accepting the food is usually a sign of accepting the mate. It's on a higher part of the island that the royal terns nest to reduce the risk of the nest being flooded at the highest tides. The nests are tightly bunched together, as many as six or even nine per square yard. Egg laying and the emergence of the chicks is closely synchronized throughout the colony. It's a common strategy against predators. If the colony were threatened, then there would be a huge number of chicks available all at once, so it's unlikely they'd all be eaten. Anyway, very few predators would be able to run the gauntlet of all these large, sharp beaks and get to the center of the colony. Both parents brood and catch fish and crabs for their single chick which will stay with at least one of its parents for as long as eight months while it learns to catch food for itself. On another desert island, Grand Kiaun, some 14 miles away, a close relative of the royal tern is also in the process of rearing a family. 
The Caspian tern is the largest of all terns and readily distinguished from the royal by its bright red beak. Unlike their cousins, the Caspian tern nests are well spaced out within the colony and there's a lot of aggression and rivalry between the birds. Two or three eggs are the norm for this species, laid in a shallow scrape in the loose earth. Ground temperatures can reach over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and while they're left unshaded by their parents, the chicks have to pant vigorously in order to keep cool. The Caspian tern has evolved a different anti-predator strategy from its cousin on the nearby island. Their breeding isn't synchronised, so within the colony at any one time, there are large and small chicks and eggs. Should a chick wander out of its own nest territory, it's given a hard time by the other birds. The supply of small fish and other food within the park is almost limitless, and many species of bird take advantage of this rich bounty. As well as stealing unattended eggs, the slender-billed gull feeds its chicks on regurgitated fish, unlike the terns, which use whole fish. Here on the neighboring island of Zira, the gulls breed in small groups of 30 or so nests. The groups may be up to 150 feet apart and the whole colony numbers over a thousand pairs, the largest on the African coast. Without doubt, the reason for such large congregations of birds is the abundance of fish. And until now, there's always been plenty for both the birds and the fishermen. The entire population of 500 or so immigrant fishermen live in seven small villages within the park. The immigrant have to catch enough fish, both for themselves and to trade for essentials such as rice, goats and water. There's no fresh water at all in the village of Ewick. Rainwater was collected at one time, but since the drought, the immigrant have had to buy all their water from Nwadibu in the north or Nwakshot in the south, a round trip of 200 miles by sea. The Imrigan have little experience as boat menders, and many of their launches, bought from the Canary Islands many years ago, are rotting. Today is a big day for the residents of Ewick. They're relaunching a boat that's been lying idle for many years. The whole village turns out to lend a hand. Once rigged, the boat will increase their fleet to six. We catch many different species of fish in these waters, but by far the most important is the mallet which migrate through the park. Outside the mallet season, we catch other fish such as cobine and shark, and sometimes drumfish. For each fish, we have a different method of fishing and a different season. Sharks are caught in gill nets, which prevent them from moving and so effectively drown them. But by taking both predatory and prey fish, the Imrigan have inadvertently kept a balance in these waters.
A 10-foot tiger shark is a formidable killer. As well as the tigers, milk sharks and hammerheads are regularly caught. The flesh is dried and may eventually find its way to restaurants in Japan. On almost every day of the year, the village is festooned with drying fish. No other people on Earth have such a large proportion, almost 100% of fish protein in their diet. After a few weeks, the heaps of dried flesh and fins are taken to market in order to obtain money to buy rice, the occasional goat, water, and these days medicines and batteries for the radios. It's one of the few occasions when they have any direct contact with the outside world. It's been estimated that between them, the Imra can only take around a thousand tons of fish per year. Outside the park, the story is very different. The harbour at Mauritania's major port, Nuwadibu, is filled at any one time with dozens of huge fishing vessels, and there are more out at sea. Since the iron ore market collapsed, fishing has become the important source of foreign income for Mauritania. In fact, 60% of the country's national income comes from selling fishing rights. Almost everything has a market. Cockles are dredged up from the seabed by the ton almost all will be exported. Fish of every shape and size, octopus, prawns, crayfish, and squid are caught and frozen. Few will be eaten locally. The official catch for 1987 was 720,000 tons of fish and 120,000 tons of bottom living fish. The unofficial figures are likely to be much higher than this, possibly double. Although over the past few years there has been little noticeable change in the fish catches, the actual size of individual fish is getting smaller, and a decrease in size is one of the first signs of overfishing. The commercial fishing vessels are not allowed to fish within Bank Dargao Park boundaries, but many of the smaller boats have ignored this. There is also increasing financial pressure on the government to set aside areas of the park for commercial fishing. This could have a catastrophic effect, not only on the fish, but the birds and the immigrant. The ships come here to fish from all over the world. Mauritania, one of the poorest countries in Africa, is desperate for foreign aid. The pressure to give way to the fishing interests is intense. The boats that are sent to fish here are often among the oldest still working. Many break down or are deliberately beached for a number of reasons, like insurance. Very few are washed ashore accidentally. The result is a coastline that's littered with wrecks. Nowhere else on Earth is there such a concentration.
The local people seem quite oblivious to the wrecks, although wood is in short supply here. Even the wildlife isn't deterred by their presence. The grey herons use the old wrecks as a good vantage point for fishing. But like the majority of birds in the park, they rely on remote barren islands such as Arel for nesting. Here, there's no cover or vegetation, and the herons use whatever they can find to build their nest, usually a pile of pelican bones. In this heat, it's more important to shade your eggs than to incubate them. The park's colony of white pelicans nests on the other side of the island, a few hundred yards away. The adults fish further out to sea and return with their catch for the chicks. Pelicans feed their chicks by regurgitation, but the chick has to work for its meal diving right down into the parent's throat. looks incredibly uncomfortable for both parties. But it must be very effective. The chicks grow rapidly and there's certainly no waste. Many of the larger youngsters are losing their fluffy brown chick feathers and are already capable of flying. They'll soon be joining their parents on fishing trips. In the meantime, their wing muscles need all the exercise they can get. An adult pelican has a wingspan of nearly 10 feet. The huge numbers and variety of birds here, both resident breeders and winter migrants, are a spectacular indication of the immense richness of the Bank Dargan National Park. Yet, to the Imrigan, they're little more than of passing interest. They never take birds or eggs, despite their own monotonous diet of fish. But there's one animal living in the park that the fishermen actually work with. It's an association that goes back at least 500 years and only occurs at Cap Timoris, close to the southern boundary of the park. It's the second half of November, the time of peak activity among the shoals of mullet that migrate along the shores. The Imrigans spend days looking out to sea, waiting for signs of fish. The whole village turns out to take part in a unique act of cooperation between man and a wild animal. On seeing the shoals, the fishermen begin to beat the water with poles. This seems to attract a pod of dolphins cruising offshore. As the dolphins approach, the mullets scatter and many swim toward the shore to escape. The fishermen and dolphins are now on either side of the mullet and the catching can begin.
The immigrants spread out their nets, and within minutes, they're almost full. The dolphins benefit by catching fish panicked or injured during the chaos. The pod of dolphins here is one of the largest on the coast, almost a hundred strong. And while most are common dolphins, there are also a few of the rarer Senegal River dolphins with the curious humped back. The fishermen make their way ashore with their catch. There are so many fish that even a man who is completely blind returns with his nets full. The shoals may pass again during the next week, or they may not, but the fishermen have already caught enough to see them through the next few months. Some of the catch will be eaten fresh, but the majority will be sun-dried. Despite the long association with the dolphins, this unique spectacle, like many aspects of life within the park, is under threat. The Mauritanian Ministry of Fisheries and Maritime Economy is looking at new ways to exploit the park's rich resources. The list of proposals makes startling reading. One suggestion is that the immigrant should be equipped with power boats and freezer stations to make their activities more efficient, something the immigrant themselves resist. Another proposes that all the immigrant in the park should be moved here. Commercial fishing may soon be allowed in certain designated areas within the park. This could open up the floodgates to the foreign fleets. There are also plans to extract the seagrass and algae from the shallow waters to provide fertilizer. But perhaps the most startling is the proposal that a US naval base be built right here at Cap Timorous. And that would certainly mean an end to the dolphin fishing and much else as well. To survive, Mauritania needs to exploit its limited resources. But unless it does so with an eye to the future, the Banque d'Argan National Park West Africa's most important spawning ground for fish and wintering ground for birds may be lost forever.